All right, welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about vector functions and space curves. So this covers section 13.1 from Stewart's Calculus Early Transcendentals 8th edition. Let's get started. So we have to talk about a vector function. What we mean is a function that maps real numbers to vectors, right? So it's a function whose domain is some interval in the real numbers and whose range would be the set, some set of vectors. So usually in this class, we'll talk about vector functions in V3, so or whose, whose range is in V3, so vectors of three components. So generally speaking, what that looks like, though, is if you have a vector function, it's going to be some R of t, and it's going to be you know a vector where each component is a real valued function, f, g, and h, right? Or you could write it like this. So these functions f, g, and h, we call these uh, the component functions of R. Uh, so let's do a quick example here. Find the domain of R of t, which has components uh, root t, e to the t, and natural log of t plus 1. So in this case, the domain is just going to be all of the values of t at which each one of the components is defined. So for the first one right here, right, root t is defined on the interval from 0 to infinity, the closed interval at 0 to infinity. Uh, e to the t is defined for all real numbers, so we'll just say on the interval from negative infinity to infinity. So just to point out, right, we're looking at three separate components, so you have to pick sort of the, the set on which all three of them would be defined. So for these two, these two would both be defined on here, right? Because obviously there are numbers in here at which this is not defined. And for the last one, uh, natural log of t plus 1. So remember, the argument for the natural logarithm has to be positive. So it's defined where t plus 1 is a positive number. So t has to be bigger than negative 1. So that would be negative 1 to infinity. So what's the smallest set of numbers on which all three of the, what's the biggest, sorry, I said, what's the biggest set of numbers on which all three of those are defined? So the domain of R of t is um, 0 to infinity, right? Because 0 to infinity, where inclusive on 0 is included, this is a subset of this and of this. Okay, so that's it. All right, so limits. So taking a limit of a vector function is as simple as taking the limit of all its components, right? So we define the limit as t approaches a of r of t to just be the vector whose components are the limits of f, g, and h at, at a. That's it. As long as those component functions, as long as those limits exist, right? If those limits all three exist, then that limit exists. So uh, we can also define continuity for vector functions. So a vector function r is continuous at a as long as the limit as t approaches a of r of t equals r of a. So it's, it's the same definition that we had for functions in, in math 2a or in calculus class, um, but now we have vector functions instead. So what this boils down to, though, is that a function, a vector function r, is continuous at a if all of its components are, because this limit will be equal to this if each one of these limits, right, if this is f of a, and this is g of a, and this is h of a. So that's it. So a vector function is continuous at a as long as all of its components are. All right, so let's find the limit as t approaches 0 of r of t, where r of t is cosine t, uh, t over e to the t, and t squared plus 2. So the limit, we can do this just component by component, the limit as t approaches 0 of cosine t. Well, cosine is a continuous function for all real numbers, so it's just cosine of 0, which is 1. The limit as t approaches 0 of t over e to the t. So this one, let me see, check yourself. Do you remember how to do this kind of limit? Oh, wait. No, sorry. This is actually easier than I thought it was. Uh, so this is just going to be 0, right? It's It's t goes to 0 as t goes to 0, and e to the t goes to 1. So you get 0 over 1, which is just 0. My brain thought that was a low tall problem, because, but it's not t going to infinity, it's t going to 0. That's fine. Uh, so it's easier than I thought. The limit as t goes to 0 of t squared plus 2. Well, again, that's a polynomial, so it's continuous for all real numbers. So that's just 0 plus 2. 
which is 2. So the limit as t goes to 0 of r of t is just uh, the vector 1, 0, 2, which turns out is it's exactly r of 0. So it is continuous at 0. We, didn't, we weren't asked, but that's fine. All right, moving along. So a space curve, so a space curve is the set of all points in three-dimensional space that are parameterized by, uh, you know, x equals a function of t, y equals a different function of t, or it could be the same function, and z is a function of t, so h of t. So where f, g, and h, these are continuous real value functions defined on some interval i. So when we say a space curve, we just mean a curve where each, you know, take all the points in space x, y, and z, where x, y, and z are just given as functions of t. So basically, it's just a parametric curve in space. When we talk about parametric curves um, in chapter 10, uh, those were only looking at plane curves, right, where you had x equals f of t, y equals g of t. So now we just have z equals h of t along with those, OK? So any space curve can be thought as being traced out by a vector function, right? So these parametric curves, you can represent a space curve as parametric equations like this. Or you can just represent it as a vector function. That should be of t down here. OK. But what you can think of is, though, technically, this gives you the points in space, right? For any t, it gives you a point in, in x, y, z space. For any t down here, you get a vector. But it's the position vector of that point. So when, say, t is like 1, you're going to get 3. You're going to get the coordinates. When t is 1 here, you're going to get a vector that starts at the origin and points to that same point that these three guys represent. So what you can think of is you can think of these vectors as arrows, right? And as t varies, they just trace out the curve. The tip of the, the arrows traces out the curve in space. So it's just, it, you can represent a curve using either one. It's just two different ways to think about it, basically. All right, describe the space curve defined by the vector function r of t equals 2 minus 3t, uh, 1 plus 5t, and negative 2t. All right, you had a moment to think about it? So this is just a line, right? Um, you have x equals, this is, the space curve could also be written x equals 2 minus 3t, y equals 1 plus 5t, and z equals negative 2t. And so that's just the parametric equations of a line, right? And so it's a line, it's a line through the point uh, 2, 1, 0 in the direction negative 3, 5, negative 2, right? So these constants give you the point it's through, and the, so the constant here is 0. And the coefficients of t give you the direction numbers. So that's it. Sketch the curve whose vector equation is r of t equals cosine t sine t t. So Here's the thing, if you only had x equals cosine t and y equals sine t, then that would give you a circle, right? So if you were ignoring the t, com the, the z component of these vectors, right? If you were standing on top of the z-axis, I know the z-axis goes on forever, but let's suppose that you can hit that point at infinity. If you were standing up there, looking straight down, all you would see is a circle. But the, the curve itself, though, it's changing height. As t grows, right, it goes, it's going to make keep making circles as you go around the, the sort of the, the z-axis, but the height is growing. And so what you actually have is a spiral, what we call a helix. So if you were to draw this picture here, right, you have, like I said, in the xy plane, you have, basically, you have circles being made that sort of, if you look straight down, all of these spirals collapse into being a circle, but the height, you know, the height gets higher as z gets bigger. And so you have what's called a spiral or a helix, okay? And it should look more uniform than that. I didn't do a good job drawing it. Um, here we have the picture from the textbook, and you can see, basically, if you looked at, like, just x equals cosine, x equals cosine t, y equals sine t, and you let z be anything. So imagine instead of having a parametric curve, you just had uh, the circle x squared plus y squared equals 1, right? That would para parametrize that circle in the xy plane. Sorry. It would give you the Cartesian equation of the circle in the xy plane. But in xyz space, x squared plus y squared equals 1 gives you a cylinder, right? A circular cylinder. 
So that curve lies in along that cylinder. It's basically going along the outside of that cylinder, and its height is just given by whatever whatever t is. But you get a you get a a helix nonetheless. Okay, so let me just write that down. So it's, the shape is called a helix. Okay. There's a little bit in your book about DNA has the shape of a helix, and you can see the information there if you don't already know it. If you didn't take like a single biology class in college yet, which you'd already know. All right. Uh, find a vector equation, a vector and parametric equations for the line segment that joins the point uh, P, which has coordinates 1, 5, 1, and the point Q, which has coordinates 2, 0, 3. So if you remember, the line segment between two vectors or two points is given by, say, R0 times 1 minus T plus R1 times t for t between 0 and 1. So if we just take the position vector of p and the position vector of q as r0 and r1, so our r of t will look like this, right? It will just be um, the vector 1, 5, 1 times 1 minus t plus the vector 2, 0, negative 3 times t, um, and then again from t goes from 0 to 1, that'll give you the line segment from uh, p to q. Basically, it's going to trace out the line segment from p to q, right? Because when t is 0, when t is 0, what do you get? You get 1, 5, 1, right? Because you're going to get 1, 5, 1 times 1, this is going to be 0, and when you get t is 1, this is going to be just the point 2, 0, negative 3. This is going to be 0. And so when t is between 0 and 1, it just traces out the line segment in between them. Um, so if we want to have, if we want to write this as a, you know, components, or if we want the parametric equation, we've got to simplify it a little bit. So we can multiply out, basically, or we can sort of combine these things. So you have, um, you're going to have 1 minus t times 1 for the first component, and then plus 2t. So you're going to get 1 minus t plus 2t, so it's going to be 1 plus t, if I did that right, for the first component. For the second component, you're going to have 5 minus 5t plus 0t, so it's just going to be 5 minus 5t. And for the third component, you're going to have 1 times 1 minus t uh, minus 3t, so it's going to be 1 minus 4t. So there's the, if we want to write the vector equation as a, the vector function as an actual vector function with component functions, and then the parametric equations are just going to be those. And don't forget, this is if we want just the line segment, then it's going to be from t goes from 0 to 1. And that's it. OK? All right, one last example here. Find a vector function that represents the curve of intersection of the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 1 and the plane y plus z equals 1. So if we only cared about the x, y coordinates, if we were looking at just the x, y plane, x squared plus y squared plus 1 gives us a, the, the unit circle in the x, y plane. So if we were looking, again, staying on top of the z axis, all of this curve would have to be, since it's a curve of intersection, it has to exist on that cylinder. So the height is going to be something. But the x and y coordinates of this curve are going to have to be given by x equals cosine t and y equals sine t for t between 0 and 2 pi. Now, the height, right, we need three, we need three uh, components here. We need x, y, and z. But we can get the z just by using the, the plane, y plus z equals 2, right? z is going to be... 2 minus y, but the y is sine t, so it's just going to be 2 minus sine t. So we get the vector function, r of t, is going to be cosine t, sine t, and 2 minus sine t. And that's it. Now, you don't even need to see a picture to actually do this, but the picture can help you visualize, well, what does this look like? And what we have, right, is you have, here's the cylinder. Here's the cylinder, uh, x squared plus y squared equals 1. And then the line cuts through it. And you can see when the line cuts through it, you get an ellipse. And in fact, 
if you recall from whatever your pre-calc class where you learned about conic sections was, where does what does the ellipse come from? It's when you take a cone, right? That's why it's called conic sections, and you cut through the cone with a plane at an angle. Um, if you cut it parallel to the base, you got a circle, right? But if you take a, a plane that's not parallel to the base of the cone, you tilt that plane a little bit, you get an ellipse. And it's the same thing here. So this is this is the ellipse that we get with our parametric curve. All right, that's it. It's a short section. Um, you know, do some homework, practice this stuff. Um, we're starting to get into the actual calculus of sort of where we are here. We get out of chapter, chapter 12. Chapter 12 is boring for me. It's, you know, just talking about geometry. I'm not a big fan of geometry. But now we're actually into some, some math, talking about functions again. So, all right, that's it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask in class or drop me a line. Take care.